Well, hello all. I'm Seth for Privacy, and thank you so much for joining the first episode of Journey to Sovereignty. Uh, we're beyond thrilled to kick off a place for us to chat about all things sovereignty, the why and how of reclaiming your digital sovereignty, and to give you all a chance to chime in, ask questions, and join the conversation. Journey to Sovereignty is brought to you by Foundation, where we build Bitcoin-centric tools that empower you to reclaim your digital sovereignty. We started off with our Passport Harder Wallet and Envoy mobile app. Uh, but today we're going to go back actually to the basics. What even is sovereignty and why do we talk about it so much at Foundation? As always, I'm joined by Bitcoin Q&A, head of customer experience here at Foundation, and our CEO and co-founder, Zach Herbert. How's it going, guys? Hey, Seth. Doing well. Looking forward to uh, the inaugural uh, Foundation Spaces. And uh, yeah, got some exciting topics lined up. And uh, yeah, looking forward to diving in. Yeah, I'm excited just to uh, sit here and listen to uh, both of you, you know, talk. Because I would do that even if it wasn't part of the Spaces. And uh, it's a three-way show. <laughs> I'm excited will, for, uh, for well. everybody's perspective here. So <laughs> going to be a good time. Um, just a quick reminder on format for those who didn't see beforehand. We're going to kind of have a podcast style for the first 40 minutes or so, uh, and then we'll leave the end for questions and answers. Um, and those can be on topic. They can be off topic. So we're really game to kind of answer whatever y'all are curious about uh, in those last 20 minutes. So we'll see where we end up there, but uh, we'll go ahead and get rolling now. Um, to kick it off, I really just wanted to chat about what is sovereignty? I mean, we, we use this term all throughout our language at Foundation. Uh, it's a much more common term within Bitcoin circles than really anywhere outside of it that I've been. Um, but it, it often is something that people outside of Bitcoin don't really understand. They don't know what it means when we talk about sovereignty. Um, and we've had a lot of conversations within the company about that. And I'd, I'd just love to hear y'all's thoughts on how you view sovereignty um, and how you how you kind of explain that to people. Yeah, I guess I can uh, kick things off. I mean, sovereignty uh, is, you know, it's a very uh, broad term, very broad subject and topic and something that can be looked at in a multidimensional way. Um, and it means different things to different people, I guess, speaking more personally. Uh, sovereignty to me uh, is about sort of um, ultimately some freedom, um, and the ability for you to uh, impact your own life through the this, through the decisions that you make, um, and again, that could cover many different topics of your life, which I'm sure we'll get into later. Uh, but yeah, it comes down to freedom, um, and with that freedom, um, unfortunately, you are going to have to take some personal responsibility and take it upon yourself to. Um, again, foundation tagline to reclaim that sovereignty. Uh, nobody's going to, especially uh, today uh, in the current uh, you know, global and economic climate, you, the sovereignty is unfortunately not given. It's something that you have to uh, take upon yourself and take some personal responsibility to, uh, to realize and to benefit from. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, sovereignty to me, to cap it off is just is freedom and personal responsibility. I have said it uh, better myself, Q&A. You know, for me, I think it's also about uh, independence, about knowing that I'm not depending on someone else. Uh, for example, you know, if you're storing your Bitcoin, right, knowing that you're not depending on something like an exchange, um, or if you're, you know, able to do things like produce your own energy or grow your own food or so on, right? It's it's knowing that you can depend on yourself for your basic needs instead of having to outsource that to some kind of third party. Um, and I think another thing that has is really something I figured out more in the last, last year or two um, that I didn't really think about beforehand is just the importance of, of uh, privacy, you know, as part of sovereignty. And I'm sure Seth, Seth for privacy <laughs> wants to say more about that. But, um, <laughs> you know, when, when I, I started caring a lot about Bitcoin self-custody I just assumed, you know, storing your own keys was enough, right? But now I'm realizing that it's not just about storing or controlling, you know, those keys or, or whatever for yourself. It's, it's actually about being able to select, you know, decide who you selectively disclose that information to. You know, I would put forward the challenge that you cannot truly be a sovereign individual without having... Um, you know, good control over your privacy. Yeah, I mean, that was, that was one of the things I was 
wanting to be sure we hit on because there is this intersection between privacy and sovereignty. It's, it's similar, I think, to the intersection between privacy and security, where these things go really tightly hand in hand. And there, there really is no having one without the other two, really, both security and sovereignty um, go with privacy hand in hand. So I think those are very important concepts. Um, and I think something that, I mean, it's a big focus for us here, and it's been a big focus for me in the the last few years that I've been involved in the space is is really helping both to build and to educate on the the means to reclaiming your sovereignty. Because it really is something where if you don't have the tools in your disposal, it's going to be hard, if not impossible, to gain personal sovereignty um, and to help others to gain personal sovereignty. So that's a that's a big reason why, like I constantly talk about the very specific tools and approaches that you need as part of that. Um, and obviously, Bitcoin is a, a huge part of that. And Bitcoin is the one that unlocks financial sovereignty. Uh, but that's that's only a single piece of, um, of what goes into personal sovereignty there. Um, I think another thing that I'm, I'm curious about is how, how do you all go about defining it when describing it to others? Like just coming back to that idea of most people, when you say the word sovereignty, maybe they think of like sovereign citizens or maybe it's a, a weird word that they attribute to like British royalty or something. It's, it's a term that we don't use often these days. Um, so how do you actually go about talking to other people and helping to show them why personal sovereignty and why reclaiming digital sovereignty are valuable concepts and, and kind of how we use that language? Yeah, it's interesting. You mentioned the term sovereignty and how it's kind of uh, deemed across the world. And I think one of the the common usages is like... Um, when people refer to sovereign nations where, you know, there might be a country that isn't, say, part of a larger conglomerate like the EU and that country is deemed to have a certain level of autonomy over its own decisions. And I think that is applicable to the individual as well. Um, so, yeah, I think sovereignty as a concept is about sort of being in uh, more control of your own life and your own decisions. And, you know, that can that can be applied to, like I say, individuals or even up to nation states. Um, but that that concept of being in control and reducing that reliance on third parties, such that you've um, got the freedom to make to make those all important decisions on you know, be it how you deal with your money or where your food comes from, or you know how much you where you keep your savings and where you store your wealth. It, it, it's a multifaceted uh, concept, um, but yeah, t- being in control is a good sort of summary that I found that hits home with people who are more foreign to the concept of sovereignty. I think it's interesting too, when you look at how this concept hits in different parts of the world, because I think like coming from the U S there's oftentimes the feeling that we can rely on third parties, that we can trust these institutions that we can trust the government. I think that's very quickly eroding, but I think there's more of a feeling or at least a, a reluctant feeling that we can give over control of these things and trust that someone will do what is necessary to help to preserve us or to give us freedom and that kind of thing. But I think if you look at like countries in Europe, countries that have undergone dictatorships, uh, Eastern Europe bloc, like there are a lot of areas in the world where they've had to go through, unfortunately, really hard times with governments that harm them, with institutions that harm them. And it's a lot easier to translate that concept there. Um, like I was just talking to people from Czechoslovakia today, and they were talking about how it's a lot easier to orange pill people to show people why Bitcoin matters there than when they're anywhere else, because it's a it's a really easy concept for people to understand. I want to remove third parties. I don't want to trust other people. I trust myself more than I trust others. Um, but that can be a harder concept to translate when we're talking to people in the in the US or people in countries that have at least felt free for a while. Yeah, and I do think that the it's funny if you look at like the definition of sovereignty, it's usually like referring to as QA mentioned, like a sovereign nation, you know, like an autonomous state. Or oftentimes like um it refers to like um like sovereign powers, you know, in terms of like the you hear terms like power and things like that and the definition of sovereignty. I think it's really interesting. I almost feel like we're um, we're kind of taking a term that would more traditionally apply to like a nation and applying it now to individuals, which I think aligns so perfectly with all the kind of technology that we're building on today, like in, in like Bitcoin, um, where we're saying, you know, at one point in time, you had, you know, sovereign nations 
uh, and you needed, you, you know, you depended on the nation for certain things, like for, you know, having a currency that you could use to uh, save with and transact with. And now with technology like Bitcoin and the internet in general, uh, you know, we're moving to a time where uh, you don't need to trust the nation or someone else. You can actually achieve it yourself as a sovereign individual. And so when I talk to people about the definition of sovereignty, I actually very much often reference that that famous book, of course, The Sovereign Individual, which I think is such a fantastic and uh, fantastic you know, thing to read. It's a little dense, but highly recommended for, for all the listeners. Yeah, and I think that that shift from the idea of like a sovereign nation state to each of us being able to take back our own sovereignty and really building a kind of a, a nation state of one, if you will, or of you and and your your friends and family, um, I think is a big one where we start to shift this idea from having a government that we trust, even a local government that we trust more than we trust a, a broader government, like a federal government but shifting it to trusting yourself ultimately. And I think that's where this idea of personal responsibility becomes such a big focus. Um, and I feel like there's this, this rabbit hole that comes from Bitcoin that leads people down this idea of personal responsibility. But ultimately, when we look at sovereignty, you can't really be truly sovereign if you won't take personal responsibility. Um, and that, that applies to so many different areas. But what are y'all's thoughts on kind of why personal responsibility is such a big focus and maybe even like how you talk to people about why it's worth taking that personal responsibility? Yeah, I think it, it's probably worth circling back to recap on what you uh, alluded to earlier, Seth, about when you were talking to, to people from different parts of the world and um, how how those people have such a bigger focus on on personal responsibility and sovereignty because uh, they've had their rights infringed on, infringed on. They've or they've had their money inflated away by mismanaged governments, um, or they've been, you know, uh, any number of tyrannical. You know, insert the the latest uh, news headline here. Uh, for those people that have experienced that firsthand and have seen their wealth disappear, their purchasing power disappear, um, or their food supply, you know, dry up. Um, <laughs> you don't need to explain the importance of you know being able to. Um, source food easily uh, or to save your wealth outside of the hands of the government to those types of people because they know exactly you know the ramifications of not doing that um, the difficulty we have you know particularly in the western world is is where people where there's this sort of slow creep of of rights infringement where people's sovereignty is being slowly eroded and most people are sadly uh, asleep to the fact and kind of just go along uh, their merry way as long as they can get their Starbucks on their way to work and you know they they can just about cover the bills at the end of the month and they don't really see a need to look up from their phones and, and wake up a little bit so it's much harder to get that message across to to the Western civilization and um, just because of the nature of the fact of how how sort of slow the creep is in terms of um, the the erosion of their sovereignty yeah I think what um what woke me up to it especially and actually is uh kind of coincidental because we we founded you know foundation in uh end of march of 2020 just as covid was getting started and you know as you're saying you know people in the western world typically aren't as uh, aware of the importance of sovereignty but seeing the covid response firsthand and you know living through that and, and seeing, for example, the, the push for mass lockdowns, um, it just felt really dystopian. And it was a huge wake up call for me to start thinking a lot more about, uh, you know, the the reliance on just uh, on the government and on just blindly trusting kind of whatever the authority tells you is correct. As soon as you start to do your own research and really think about stuff for yourself, you start to realize that, well, maybe that's not the case. And so I, I do think people in the Western world are waking up to the importance of sovereignty and really feeling it, um, especially, you know, with everything that's happened over the last uh, couple of years. Yeah, yeah. For me, I, that that idea hits home um, really uh, surfing back again to what we talked about before because of my jumping down the privacy rabbit hole. I don't think even when I discovered Bitcoin, when I discovered Monero, I didn't really care about the idea of personal sovereignty. 
Um, but once I started to dive down the privacy rabbit hole and started to realize that governments and corporations were actively abusing the the data and control that we were giving them, that they were going out of their way to harm even their own citizens by using those tools and using the permissions that either we had given them or we hadn't, but they had claimed without asking. Um, it, it started to help me to understand why we can't trust these institutions anymore. I, I can't trust the U.S. government um, anymore. Probably never could. I mean, really, if you look back at history, it was probably hasn't been a good time to trust the U.S. government in a, lo a long, long time. But that really started to shake me awake because I understood that when I'm trusting my data with these corporations, when I'm trusting my data, my network traffic, whatever, with governments, uh, even it, when I'm not explicitly choosing to trust them, but they are taking advantage of of the system and gaining surveillance and gaining power, it really started to help me to to grasp why I needed to take back that personal sovereignty, take that personal responsibility. And that extended like far beyond Bitcoin or Monero, but that's, that's why I've gotten so deeply into self-hosting. That's why I've obviously gotten into privacy and education around uh, those concepts. And it really is a holistic thing where once you realize that these people who maybe you thought you were able to trust or you were raised to trust these institutions, once you realize that difference, it becomes a clear necessity, I think, to take that personal responsibility. Uh, it's a really hard thing to avoid once you really do kind of have your eyes open to that. Um, and I think, like you said, COVID and the the response by governments, the abuse of power, the abuse of cell phone surveillance, location surveillance, lots and lots of things that we saw all across the world um, throughout that crazy, crazy couple of years was a wake up call for many in the Western world. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that we've learned over the long term is often people have to get burnt before they start to understand why these things matter. Um, and a lot of people got burnt during COVID and a lot of people are getting burned regularly by governments shifting more and more authoritarian. So as they do get burned, I think that idea of personal responsibility and, and ultimately sovereignty starts to hit home more and more. Any other thoughts on kind of why the idea of sovereignty hits home for either of you? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, stating the obvious uh, alongside you guys here is that particularly in the last, for me personally, the last uh, couple of years, uh, world governments have done a really great job of, of waking uh, a small percentage of the population's eyes up a little bit as to the 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 um, madness of, you know, the various policies and infringements, etc. So that was a big one for me. Uh, but before that, um, I was the, the sort of average uh, MPC that trusted the government that uh, did as he was told and didn't question what was on the news and um, it was only because of, of falling down the Bitcoin rabbit hole for me personally that um, I started to learn let alone what money was but why our current monetary system was broken and then from there there's you know hundreds of different uh, branches of you know all everything that's that's up with current society in terms of the food supply the supply chains um, you know the quality of our food etc um, all of these different rabbit holes opened up just because the bitcoin space attracts people who are gen generally uh, distrusting of authority and certainly of governments and you know the, those people that have been around longer than me um, actively looking you know to take that personal responsibility and to um, to look where they can increase their personal sovereignty um, in their whole life not just about you know reclaiming their monetary sovereignty via saving and spending through Bitcoin in, in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion. Um, so if, if it wasn't for Bitcoin, I'd probably still be working my nine-to-five job and just being the, the standard uh, stereotypical NPC that didn't question anything and lapped up everything that was all of the fear porn that was um, shown on the news every day. So, uh, yeah, Bitcoin was my my first intro. Uh, and, yeah, it's a never-ending uh, never list of rabbit holes thereafter. And I'm sure there's, the end is definitely not in sight. I mean, same for me, right? With Bitcoin, I feel like uh, by once you be, once you get really deep into Bitcoin and and realize that the entire monetary system is completely broken, um, you start to kind of question everything. Um, I'm sure Q and A, a lot of people in the UK and the EU are are questioning things with the uh, energy policies going on right now. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, we, we alluded to the fact earlier that, you know, people don't tend to open their eyes until they, you know, touch the proverbial stove. Well, uh, for everybody in, in particularly in Europe this year, uh, their hands have, have well and truly touched the stove in terms of their energy bills that have gone just 
ridiculous um, and that's driven mainly because of the the ridiculous policies and the ESG bullshit and all of the green energy um, you know these governments that are striving for this quote unquote clean energy um, net zero by 2050 etc cetera, etc cetera. well unfortunately the, the the fallout from that is that you know their, their citizens and the, the people that live in their countries are suffering immediately and um, we've been lucky so far particularly in the UK where I am that we've had a really mild winter so people haven't uh, have to have the heating on but if we we were going to be uh, hit by a particularly cold snap then the the ramifications of some of these policies and and the fact that we've got absolute 100 percent reliance on external energy give or take um then uh, people are really suffering and um, so you know and, and particularly energy is definitely not an easy one uh, to take back your sovereignty on it's you, you know it's difficult to uh to, to create some energy out of thin air, obviously, um, but uh, yeah, in, especially on the nations, the nation state uh, stage, um, the EU have been caught with their pants down uh, in terms of energy reliance on Russia, etc. Um, so yeah, you know, like like we alluded to earlier, the this sovereignty goes all the way back up to nation states. You know, if you become reliant on somebody else, your sovereignty can be taken away almost immediately at the turn of a hat. So next on the list for foundation is uh, becoming an oil company so we can start helping people to reclaim their their energy sovereignty <laughs> i thought you were gonna say nuclear but uh <laughs> oh that's true even better nuclear uh nuclear generators for your own home nuclear <laughs> reactors will be the next step um so obviously we've all touched on how bitcoin was a big part of of our story diving into the the idea of sovereignty um, but where do you see Bitcoin really fitting in as one of these these tools to help us reclaim sovereignty? Um, I think obviously it hits on the financial sovereignty aspect, but I think it has a lot broader reaching impact um, on this idea of, of taking back our personal sovereignty. Yeah, I can start. Um, I think the financial aspects are pretty obvious. You know, I think being able to control your own money uh, is hugely important. But I also think that by taking sovereignty of your own money via Bitcoin, it means that you're taking away sovereignty from uh, governments, right? It means that you are actually storing that wealth and and uh, hopefully helping to ultimately defund, um, you know, governments that are waging war and, you know, putting forward very poor energy policies and I think ultimately, you know, uh, hurting uh, human progress at this point. So I looked at it as, you know, it, it's it's not just about storing your own keys. It's actually about uh, essentially forcing the separation of money and state. And I think the only way you force that separation is if you actually take your sovereignty back. Um, you know, if you're just using uh Bitcoin and storing it on Coinbase or FTX or something like that. I mean, that's not going to lead to a separation of money and state. Kind of yeah. becomes not your coins, not your sovereignty. This <laughs> may be another way to spin that because <laughs> ultimately you don't gain sovereignty from Bitcoin that you don't both have the ability to make transactions as you see fit and that you don't have privacy from. And I think that's, I mean, that's why we, I mean, most of us here harp on this idea of avoiding KYC at all costs and actually custodying your own keys and taking these extra steps and not just kind of stacking sets on a centralized exchange and leaving them there. Because ultimately, you're not gaining any sovereignty from Bitcoin if you do that. So it's important that we take extra steps to further empower um, further empower Bitcoin's usage. Uh, and I think that's that's kind of a big idea that we'll, we'll definitely be talking about more, but it's it's not the situation where you can just take Bitcoin and even just take it and store it on a hardware wallet, keep it safe. Um, but you have to take a very holistic approach to personal sovereignty. And Bitcoin is one of these tools that I think has an outsized impact because when we have financial freedom, we ultimately are able to defend our rights, our other rights, our rights to privacy, our rights to um choosing who has our data, who does what with it, our, our general human rights are able to be preserved when we have financial freedom and really only when we have financial freedom. So I really do think that that Bitcoin is the the key to unlocking personal sovereignty. Um, but it's certainly not the only tool that's kind of in our in our toolkit or that needs to be in our toolkit there. Um, 
And obviously, Bitcoin is important within our company, within foundation. We've seen it as a vital need there. Um, so do you mind diving into a little bit of like why we started with a Bitcoin signing device with a hardware wallet by, by starting with Passport um, and, and why that was the initial focus for us as a company? Yeah, I'm happy uh, to, uh, you want to you wanna kick it off? I, I was going to say, yeah, I'll, I'll jump in and then I'll let the CEO chime in and knock it out of the park after me. Um, yeah, I think, um, you know, the last, you know, our generation and the, the couple of generations before us have been uh all of their lives they've grown up uh, not having to take uh with the exception of physical cash and not have to sort of take uh, personal custody of their money and they, they don't need to worry about that they just rely on the banks for better or for worse and you know if, if something you know if, if the bank gets frauded or their car gets frauded and the money comes back and they don't have that, that anything to worry about and for the most part especially in the western world that that works for most people uh, aside from the, the whole inflation piece, etc., cetera. Um, transitioning from somebody from that to, uh, okay, this is Bitcoin. If you if you do it properly, uh, you need to take some personal responsibility and you need to secure uh, these 12 words, um, which to most of us in the space doesn't actually seem that hard. If you've been here for more than a couple of months and you've actually gone through the process and realized, oh my God, actually, it's not that difficult. The, just the concept of taking that personal responsibility and, and being in full control of your own money is is you know out of the realms of possibility for most people or see, so they would think when they were coming into the space and first discovering this so yeah to summarize you know self custody is, is hard for people coming in and cold storage uh, is even harder um, once you've got over that initial hurdle of okay uh, I've got this app on my phone and I need to look after these 12 words and if I lose my phone then I need to know what to do with these 12 words like I say that's that's foreign enough for most people but to then add a physical device into that with with backups and different menu systems etc especially for people who may may be didn't grow up uh, in the digital age with a mobile phone from the age of four that's going to be an even more foreign concept so where I see foundation hopping into that space is to um, is to bridge that gap and make people realize that cold storage, cold Bitcoin storage doesn't have to be uh, this big scary thing. And yes, it's going to be uh, a step in terms of the personal responsibility that you're going to have to take. Uh, there's no getting away from that. That's just how Bitcoin works. Um, but to be able to have the most secure uh, platform to store your Bitcoin in, uh, I see foundation as bridging that gap uh, so that People can have the easiest experience they can possible. Um, that's built with an, you know, an intelligent user interface that doesn't scare people away. Uh, that's where I see the void that we're starting to fill um, to make that self custody, particularly around cold storage, far more approachable. Yeah, and um, I mean, I think as as all of us have echoed, Bitcoin is the gateway drug uh, towards greater sovereignty. And so when we were starting up the company a couple of years ago, um, we were thinking, you know, what's the most important place to start where we can make a real impact? And I, I think by far the most important thing is to get everyone storing their own keys, you know, get all these coins off of exchanges. I mean, we all know what just happened in the last few weeks with, with FTX. You know, I, I think it's just so important to focus our early efforts there. You know, we were definitely brainstorming things like doing something like a node. I, I know we're all into uh, self-hosting as well and, um, you know, having your own sovereign uh, computing infrastructure and so on. But I think we were just trying to figure out, you know, what's going to have the broadest, you know, most important impact. Because once you actually start storing your own keys and you get into Bitcoin self-custody and sovereignty, I think you just naturally start to look around to see, you know, what else can I improve in, in, in terms of, uh, you know, level, leveling up and, and becoming, you know, a sovereign individual. And uh, so, yeah, so, so that's why we started with, uh, with Passport. Yeah, I mean, I think obviously I'm the newest one here on the team um, out of the, the three of us that are joining. But for me, I think that it, it really hits home because once we enable more people to reclaim their financial sovereignty, like you said, it really is a, a rabbit hole where more and more things, uh, there are more and more things that they'll be able to to start to learn about, to take advantage of, and start to reclaim sovereignty in different areas. So I think like a big key for me, and this is why I focused on education in this space, is 
that we need this to not be a thing where just tech savvy people can reclaim their digital sovereignty. Like, I think that's one of the most frustrating parts as people get into like the privacy space is oftentimes there's a very elitist attitude where it's like, you have to learn all of the perfect tools. You have to uh, use them all perfectly. You have to learn the perfect uh, approach to each thing. And most of the tools are either not easy to use or like CLI only. There's a lot of complexity within the broader sovereignty space. Uh, and and one area where I do see that that key benefit and, and one of the reasons why I love Passport and and why it was such a draw for me to actually join the team is that I saw that this is a way that we can really empower more people who are not tech savvy, who are not maybe native to the, the digital world, um, who are not native to the cryptocurrency world to be able to tar- start taking these steps, to start with financial sovereignty, and to do it in a way that's pretty foolproof, that's pretty straightforward, um, and that's, uh, I think, a, a great starting point for people like y'all hit on. Um, so just a reminder, we'll, we'll have a little bit more to touch on here, but we are going to take questions after the final topic. Um, so go ahead and be ready to, to ask to come up on stage. I'll handle that and bring all on stage and, and we can answer some questions, have some open Q&A time. Um, again, it doesn't have to be on topic. Obviously, it can be, uh, but we're welcome to just kind of chat all things self-custody, foundation, privacy, uh, whatever kind of hits y'all's fancy. Um, but to go ahead and wrap up here, kind of how do you view the state of the world in light of this concept of personal sovereignty uh, and, and both the ability to reclaim it and the need to reclaim it? Um, we've hit on a lot of different areas. We've hit on kind of COVID as being a catalyst, on uh, oppressive dictatorships as being a catalyst, but kind of how do you view the world right now um, in light of the, these concepts? And, and do you view it as getting better or worse? Yeah, so I'm uh, kind of torn. Uh, I think uh, if you uh, take a, a little look around you, uh, you know, read some of the, the headlines and the topics and policies that have been uh, proposed or uh, imminently being uh, implemented, you know, in, in all facets of, of you know modern culture, uh, the immediate future, you know, you could look at it as as being one that's pretty bleak, especially around the monetary system. You know, inflation running rampant, central bank digital currencies looming. Um, you know, there's lots of stuff that is, you know, on the horizon that um, are, are not part of the future that I would like to see. Uh, but on the flip side to that, you know, I'm hopeful that more and more of the world are waking up. Um, again, I touched on that the, you know, governments around the world are doing a fantastic job of, of making themselves look fairly foolish, uh, which is slowly, uh, not as fast as I would like, but it's waking um, a small percentage of the population up. Um, but with that said, you know, there is still a majority that are sort of quote unquote sleep, sleepwalking into a bit of a, uh, a train wreck. Um, but more broad, you know, to bring it closer to home in terms of Bitcoin, uh, super bullish on, you know, the, the emergence of loads of great um, free and open source projects. Uh, the, 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 the community is continuing to flourish, even in the, the current bear market. And uh, communities are, 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 you know, very supportive and um, everybody's, you know, the this, this, this space has a, a sort of standing on the shoulders of giants um, ethos or mentality. And, you know, that gives me incredible hope for what we're building here, um, not just at Foundation, but especially um, just in the Bitcoin, the wider Bitcoin ecosystem, uh, bullish on all of the builders and the people that are uh, you know, taking self-custody and taking part in the peer-to-peer economy. Uh, I think we just got to keep doing what we do and um, hopefully we will win in the end. Yeah, I really, it, it's kind of a, a hard question to answer because I do think that the the need for sovereignty is becoming more and more dire. I think we're, we're seeing that governments are reaching and reaching and reaching for more and more power. Um, it's not something where governments are getting smaller or giving back power to the people, but it's, a, I think, a situation globally where we're entering more and more authoritarian waters. Um, so I think the the need for it is more and more dire. But like you hit on q and I do think that the the tools and the, the means that we have at our disposal for reclaiming sovereignty are absolutely getting better and better and better. Um, and I think we've really seen this across the board. And, and there's been an, an explosion in the free and open source software space that's been a huge part of that. I mean, and that's been ongoing for decades. Um, but there's also been this explosion around Bitcoin that is also part of that free and open source software space that I think is so powerful. And 
and this this focus on freedom and on making sure that software and hardware are open source and and free to use, freely available, uh, freedom as in uh, free as in freedom, uh, is a huge part of that. And and these tools are getting better. The ability for a regular person to start using Bitcoin in a non-custodial and self-sovereign way is getting better and better over time. Uh, the ability for people to host their own data is getting better and better. The ability for each one of us to use privacy preserving operating systems like Calyx OS or Graphene OS on mobile is getting better and better. Um, so I definitely think that it's a, a situation where while the need is getting more dire, the tools at our disposal are getting better and better. And as more people wake up, as more people start to build, as more people start to contribute, as more people start to donate to projects in the space um, that are just community driven, uh, I think that we will continue to see that those who wake up will have an easier and easier time actually taking these actionable steps towards personal sovereignty. Um, and, and that's the part that really excites me, makes me optimistic. Um, because even if the the need for these things becomes more dire, if we keep continuing to build the tools, if we keep continuing to build strong community, um, we we can win. And I ultimately do think that the, the light will win uh, and the darkness will not overcome. Uh, and the tools that that are getting built today are, are going to be a key part of why that happens yeah it's um it's, it's kind of crazy to look back when we were brainstorming and trying to think about what to name this company in early 2020 you know we settled on the name foundation foundation devices because uh i mean for a few different reasons but one of them was an ode to the sci-fi series by asimov foundation and in that series you know the um, the empire is essentially collapsing and, you know, a group of people decide to go establish, I guess you call it like an outpost at the edge of the universe in order to preserve humanity's knowledge, in order to ensure that the the dark ages are as short as possible and that humanity can, you know, return to an era of uh, flourishing again. And we were thinking a lot about that in the sense of Bitcoin and in the sense of how the world was getting more and more dystopian and that hopefully by transitioning to, you know, a, a Bitcoin standard, um, can we, you know, lessen those, call them dark ages and, and return to prosperity. And then all the COVID stuff happened, you know, right after we got started and so, I mean, I, I am pessimistic about the short term, but as Seth and Q&A have said, you know, very optimistic about the long term. Just while we're waiting to see if there's any questions come through, I'm uh, going to pose a question to you two guys. Um, and you're not allowed to answer with Bitcoin uh, because that would be cheating. Um, if you had to pick one tool that's helped you uh, reclaim your sovereignty, um, maybe it's the one you use most frequently or maybe it's the one that's had the most impact or you would deem it's had the most impact to your ability to to reclaim your sovereignty. If you had to pick just one, uh, what would it be uh, and why? That's a tough one. Um, I bet you Seth is going to say something like a like Monero, you know, is my guess. Uh, or like a VPN. <laughs> I think I, mine is mine's probably a weird one because you guys always hear me joking about it on our team calls. But I, I, I've been uh, set up as a delivery site for uh, for the Amish, you know, and getting all this Amish food delivered to my uh, house, and then also using it as a drop off point for others in the community to to pick up uh, food directly from the Amish and raw milk and so on. So I actually think that's had the biggest impact on me. In terms of uh, sovereignty and, and food sovereignty is just, I think, so important. Yeah, I've been uh, weirdly learning how to smuggle due to raw milk, which has been a fun experience. <laughs> I have a <laughs> have a group of people who live near me, and we we work together to smuggle raw milk across the border, and have a uh, a house that we store our our stolen or our uh, contraband goods in uh, to be able to to do drops and everything. So it's a pretty uh, Pretty weird situation to be in where wanting to reclaim food sovereignty and choose what you eat or drink, you have to do some weird things. Um, but for me, I, I think that the most important tool besides Bitcoin, um, hmm, it's hard to narrow down to one. I mean, my non-tool answer would always be community because um, I think that's the most important thing out there, or even more important than Bitcoin, uh, if, if I dare to say that. But Tool specifically, I would say probably um, 
switching up the browser that you use and using a more privacy preserving alternative like either a Brave browser or a, a hardened version of Firefox uh, like on both desktop and mobile. Uh, just because so much of what we do happens through a browser that we can reclaim some privacy and some control of our data um, from those services. I think that's a, a very important step forward, uh, but definitely hard to, to narrow down to one. Thanks for jumping in for this episode of Journey to Sovereignty. And I hope you'll join us for our next live Twitter space every other Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. GMT. Joining us live gives you a chance to listen in, participate, and get your questions answered on the spot. Follow us at FoundationDVCS on Twitter to keep up with the latest news, get notifications when we go live, and much more. See you at the next one, and thanks for joining us on the Journey to Sovereignty. Sovereignty.